So we move on to now making the LFS system bootable. And it's time to make the LFS system bootable. This chapter discusses creating the ETC FS tab file, building a kernel for the new LFS system, and installing the Grub bootloader so that the LFS system can be selected for booting at startup. So first thing we do is to create a, an ETC FS tab file. So we'll copy that in and it creates a skeleton file which we can edit with that command. And it's got some information here about uh, to replace these placeholders. Um, about setting character sets for certain languages and certain locales. Um, okay, there's no information here about using UUIDs, unfortunately, um, which I've started to prefer to use. They're just a little bit more complicated to set up. So what I'll do is I'll just stick with the uh, normal uh, slash def slash, slash SDA uh, way of doing things, um, as it's just simpler to to explain. Uh, so what we need to do is to find out our allocation, which we can find out by doing fdisk minus L. Um, in fact, we need to look at our disk, which will make the screen simpler to look at. NVNEN1. So there's our partition. So if you remember, I had partition one was my boot partition. I had a separate EFI partition. There's partition two a swap partition number three and a Linux file system P4. So let's go back in and put those in now. So the first thing we've got here is the root partition. There's the mount point. So I'll put that in first. That's going to be NVMe 0N1. Oops, if I press insert, it might help. NV, in fact, what I'll do is I'll copy it, just make sure there's no typos. So that's my root partition. Paste that in. That's going to get mounted on the root, and it's an ext type. So we can line these up under the columns, ext4 type, and options, it explains there about some of the options. Uh, the dump order, one and one. And I'll do the swap next. The swap was nvme 0 n one and that was partition three. And don't need to change anything else on that. I'll just add in the other partitions in order. Uh, in fact, I'll leave the EFI one at the moment because I think that gets mentioned a little bit later. So I'll put in partition one, which is the boot partition. So that gets mounted at boot. Um, this will be the EFI partition, so I'll just keep that remarked out for the moment. So the boot drive is also an EXT4, and I'll mount that with no auto, uh, yeah, no auto and defaults. So no auto means that it won't get mounted automatically, which is a bit of protection in case I do something a bit weird like deleting everything on the root. That means the boot partition would be deleted, or sorry, the boot files would be deleted, um, or they could be deleted. Uh, so by having separate partitions not mounted, it means that it's not going to be accessed normally, and you'd have to explicitly mount it to access the files in there. Uh, dump, I'm never too sure of these, but I think a one, that can either be a one or a zero which means it can be dumped. And this is just the file check order. So I'll do the boot as a second one to check after the root has been checked. Uh, 
So that should be sufficient. And we'll move on to the Linux kernel now. So building the kernel involves a few steps, configuration, compilation, installation, read the readme file in the kernel source tree for alternative method, methods to the way this book configures the kernel. There's some information there about um, the Linux kernel building it for the first time can be one of the most challenging tasks in FS, which is quite right. It's extremely complex now compared to how it used to be. I recently uh, did some videos on building Linux from scratch 1.0 and there was you know, probably no more than a dozen screens really to go in and tweak stuff. There's very little to change to get a kernel up and working. Um, but now there's so many devices supported by the kernel and so many options and things. Um, it's really become quite complicated. Um, because of that, I have done a video on compiling or configuring compiling a kernel in the past, um, which I should show you. It's a few years old now, but um, it's still applicable. Um, let's go to my home. So videos, if you go to playlists, uh, it's this playlist here, uh, building custom Linux kernel. It will go through, as you can see, um, building a kernel, introduction, how to configure it, testing it, and then updating it. So it goes through all about compiling it and so on and making changes. Um, so I so say it's a little bit out of date now, but it should give you a good idea uh, about what to do in, in the kernel and what you need, might need to tweak. Um, but what I'll be doing here is I'll show you um, how you can just create a kernel with default configuration options, which generally should work most of the time uh, for a fairly standard machine. You may just need to go in and tweak some things for a particular network card or wireless adapters, things like that, maybe uh, something obscure about your hardware. But generally, the default configuration works quite well. Um, so that's what I'll be doing. It's generally a good place to start. Um, if you've got kernels you've used before on the machine or, or similar machines, you can use um, another option to reuse an older kernel configuration file. Um, and I'll quickly show you how to do that as well. So we need to extract the sources for the kernel. So again, this is quite a big package. Um, it's probably bigger than GCC, but it doesn't take anywhere near as long as GCC to compile it can still take a little while on a, a slower machine um, so the first thing we need to do is to make MR proper so this just cleans the source uh, directories to make sure they're absolutely in pristine condition um, and then as it says there's several ways to configure the kernel options so if you have got um, an old config file you can copy that into this directory and call it .config. I don't know if there's one available. Um, if you've built the configuration file into the kernel, you can get hold of it by zcatting it or g g zipping it or g unzipping it rather. Uh, it will be held in the proc as config.gz. So yes, there is one here for the Gen 2 system. And just redirect that to .config, or alternative, if you've got a config, just copy it into the Linux directory. Just rename it to .config because that's the file that the uh, Linux uh, make uses by default. Um, and then you run make old config to update that config to the latest version. If there are too many changes, it will actually state that it's restarting the configuration, um, which it has done here because what's probably happened, the Gen 2 uses a slightly customized kernel uh, configuration, so it's probably not recognized something, so it's just restarted the um, update. So uh, 
that's why I'm going to get all these questions here so it's not going to work quite as well so I won't go any further with that demonstration but after you've done the old config you might just have to answer a, a few questions you know maybe a handful if it's within the same um, dot version so for example if I had a config that was 6.7.1 um, generally you don't get any questions it's just like a bug update if you like um, but Normally, if you do save an update from 6.6 .6 to 6.7, you might get the odd question that will ask you just to update it to that newer version. But other than that, it's normally a very quick way of um, getting a kernel um, updated uh, to uh, the latest version. So I'll just abandon that. I'll do the make MR proper again to start again from the beginning. And rather than going into make con menu config, I'm not sure what state that puts the configuration in. It might just use the default, I don't know. But what I tend to do is explicitly run make def config. And that will create a default configuration based on the architecture that you're uh, running make def config on. So as you can see, it says the default configuration is based on an x axis 64 bit default configuration. Now we can run make menu config because we've got a configuration file. As you can see, it says it's written the .config file. So if we run make menu config, then we'll get the nice menu in system up. And this note gives you some pointers as to some settings that should be um, added. So a good starting place for setting up the kernel configura configuration is to run make def config. This will set the base configuration to a good state that takes your current system architecture into account. Being sure to enable, disable or set the following features or the system might not work correctly or boot at all. So we'll do that now, go through all these to ensure things are set. Generally, most of these options are set, um, but it's worth checking in case the default configuration has been changed. So we need to go into general setup first, you can see here. So we'll just press enter there. Then we need to find compile the kernel with warnings as errors, which is this option here. And it's you can see they've haven't got the little asterisk there in the brackets. So we need to press space here or press N for no to remove that. Auditing support is the next option we need to look for, which is there. And again, we need to remove that. So we'll just press no or space. Space will toggle it. No will force it to clear. Uh, Yes, a Y will force it to on, um, and the spacebar will just toggle between the options. So, for example, if, if it's on a module option, it will toggle, toggle between modularizing it and turning it on or off. So, there'll be all three options will come up. Next, we need to go to the CPU task time and stats accounting, which is this sub menu here. And we want to ensure that pressure stall information tracking is set. So it isn't at the moment, so I'll just press space and we leave this other option blank. So now you can see the indentation, we need to go back up one to the previous menu. So I'll just go to exit and we look for enable kernel headers through sys kernel headers, uh, sorry, sys kernel k headers tar xz. So let's look for that. There it is there. It's already disabled, so we'll leave it like that. Now we look for control group support. There it is there, that's set already. We need to go into there because there's a submenu option, memory controller, which needs to be set. Uh, there it is there at the top. So we need to force that one on. Go back again, and then we need to look for configure standard kernel features, expert users. Uh, it's that one there, so that's not set, so that's okay. So we'll come out of that menu back to the top and we move on to processor type and features, which is there. And we need to set to build a relocatable kernel. So let's look for that one, which I think it's somewhere near the bottom. Uh, yes, there is. So it's, it's actually been forced on by another option, which is what the little dashes mean. Because it hasn't got the square brackets, we can't actually disable that. It's been it's been forced on. 
so that's okay. Um, and the other option we need to set is a sub option. Well, it's got a sub option there, but it's oh no, it's just indented here. It's at the same level. Yes, because it's indented here. So this option must appear when this option is set, and the randomizer, the address of the kernel image, is already set anyway. So that's fine. Go back up. General architecture dependent options is down here. We need to look for stack protector buffer overflow protection. So yes, you can see if I disable this, strong stack protector will disappear because it's indented, but it's not a sub menu option. It's just a dependent option on this option here. So you can see I've disabled that and it's disappeared. I enable it again. It's reappeared, but it's indented because it's reliant on that option being set. So they're both set as they should be, as it says in the book. So that's okay. We'll go back up again. Networking support. Go into that. Networking options, which is that option there. We need to make sure that TCP IP networking is enabled, which it is, and IPv6 protocol is enabled. Now, I don't use that, but I will leave it enabled um, in case System D needs it for something. I also generally remove nearly all of these options here because they're not needed but on a standard machine. But for this example, I'm just going to leave them in. Um, but normally, you can remove um, a whole host of these. As so if you look at my videos on compiling a kernel, um, I'll probably remove uh, all the appropriate ones here. Uh, including DHCP, I normally remove, but obviously if you're using DHCP, you wouldn't want to remove that. Uh, but things like boot P and RAR P there for booting over a network or remotely, I uh, won't be using that. Um, some of these options you might need to re-enable if you do install some networking utilities. Um, but for now, I wouldn't normally enable them. Um, but as I say, for this example, for this demonstration, I'm not going to touch any of those. Uh, I'm not sure if System D might might possibly use them. So that's the networking taken care of. Now we need to move on to device drivers. So that's this one here. Generic driver options. Support for uVent helper is unchecked. That's okay. Maintain a dev tempfs file system to mount a uh, dev. That's set already. As is the auto mount dev tempfs at dev. After the kernel mounted the root fs. So that's all okay. We'll go. Oh, we go down to firmware loader sub menu here. Firmware loading facility has already been set, so we can't change that. And enable the firmware sysfs call fallback me mechanisms already disabled, so nothing to change there. Go back up to firmware drivers, which is down here. Export DMI identification via sysfs to user space is already set, so there's nothing else to do there. Move on to graphics support, which is further down here. Is it, or have we already passed it? I oh, know it is, yeah, it's a couple of pages down actually. Yeah, there it is. So that's, that's two page downs I did to get there. It's quite a way down the graphics support. So we'll go into that. So DRM, Direct Rendering Manager, needs to be set. Oh, it looks like we can set any option. Um, I believe we will need to be setting this for the EFI, so I'll leave it as it is for the moment. I won't change it. It does say they've put in a little comment here, if DRM is selected as star or module, so if it's set or as a module, this must be selected. So enable legacy FD, F, frame buffer device support FB dev for your mode setting driver. So I'll select that for now. Um, and then we need to go into console display driver support, which is near the bottom, I think. Yep, there it is there. And if DRM is selected as star M, this must also be selected. So frame buffer, it's already set anyway. So that's fine. Let's exit that now. Back to the top menu where we go into file systems. <coughs> 
and now we're going to I notify support for user space so let's look for that one there it is down there it's already set now let's go into sudo file systems which is there and we want to make sure temp fs virtual memory file system support is set which it already is and tempfs posix access control list which is already set as well now we set some additional features if we're building for a 64-bit system so if you're building 32-bit you don't do these you jump down to these options here so let's quit that and go back to the top menu and back into processor type and features and set support x to apic um, if you're using menu config enabling the order of config pci msi first then config IQ remap oh it's because of the the way they uh, appear as menu options so this one's separate this x to apic you can see it's there already but we need to go to device drivers now and we need to look for PCI MSI first. So PCI MSI is this option here, which is under PCI support. So let's go into the PCI support menu and look for message signal interrupt. So that's already actually set. So that's okay. Then we need to go into config IOQ remap, which is that option there, which is under IO MMU hardware support. So backup one, IO MMU hardware support is further down the bottom. There it is there. So that's already been set. And support for interrupt remapping is that one there. Set that come back out and it does say actually that once we set these we can set the config x86 x2 apex so it could be that something else has been set already which has meant that that was already visible so we've already set that anyway uh was under process type and there it is there set still so that's fine and we could check that's the right symbol by doing help and at the top of every help page is always the symbol that's used so you can see that is correct, x86, x2, a pick. So we'll skip the 32-bit one. And there's something I need to do here because I'm using an NVMe SSD. And let's go back into the device drivers and just ensure that support is built in. So I need to look for NVMe support, which is there. You see it's not set, so I need to do a yes there to force it in. I uh, might want to put in verbose error reporting and also I'll put hardware monitoring which might be useful to monitor the temperature for example of the device um, but that's all I'd need to set um, oh it does say while the IPv6 protocol is not strictly required it's highly recommended by the system D developers so yes it is required or recommended at least by system D so that's fine that I've left that in um, there are several other options that may be desired depending on the requirements of the system. For example, list of options needed for BLFS packages, see the BLFS index of kernel settings. So that's quite useful. I've either ignored that in the past or it's something new. Because um, it's quite annoying if you're going through BLFS and you've got to continually rebuild the kernel. So that'd be quite good if you knew what you wanted to build in straight away or just go through and add all these things up front. Um, so that's that's a pretty useful page to have. Uh, oh, actually, it's a normal index, isn't it? Yeah, okay, so it's this bit here. So everything under this bit is all the kernel changes that are required for um, building certain BLFS packages. So that is yeah, a really useful thing to know. Um, if your host hardware is using UEFI and you wish to boot the LFS system with it, you should adjust some kernel configuration following the BLFS page, even if you'll use the UEFI bootloader from a host distro. So if you remember, I've kept this page here to do these kernel configurations, which we can now do. So 
let's finish off the configuration by checking these options and probably even changing some of them. So the first thing we need to do is go back to the top of the main menu and go into processor type and features and set the EFI runtime service support option which is further down the bottom somewhere there it is there it's right so it's already set so that's good if i stub support is already checked and these other options are already checked so although that's a deprecated function um, i'm going to leave that in there because it's already been set by something else or by default probably by the default config um, i'll leave that in there it could be useful although this is quite a modern machine it's probably not needed i'll leave it in there Right, so now we need to go to enable the block layer, which is this option here. You can see it's been forced on as it suggests in the LFS book, or BLFS book rather. So we'll go into that. We need to go into partition types and select advanced partition selection and ensure that EFI GUID partition support is set, which it is and it's probably not needed on this machine as i say it won't boot with an ordinary uh, legacy option um, but i'll leave this option in here anyway um, it makes the Linux from scratch image a little bit more portable if that's something i wanted to do to take a copy of the image and use it elsewhere on a, a newer machine so that's okay now i'm going to go into device drivers and ensure under firmware drivers that the mark vga vbe efi frame buffer as a generic system frame buffer is set so it isn't so i'll check that then i need to go back to graphics support again all the way down here it's near the bottom but not that close to the bottom and look for direct men rendering manager which i've already set and I need to also enable legacy FB dev support, which is set. And also set the simple frame buffer driver, which is somewhere further down. Uh, oh, there it is. I've just gone past it. So I need to set that to yes to force it on. And then under console display driver support, I need to set the frame buffer console support, which is already set. Uh, while we're here, uh, it doesn't matter. It's just purely a visual thing. If you check that and then go into the menu, you get the options here and you'll get little penguins displayed on the boot up screen, which um, you'll get one penguin per core that's been identified by the kernel. So on this machine, I'd get 16 penguins, although I don't believe they fit across the screen. But for example, on the four core machine, you'll get four penguins that appear appearing at the top of the screen, which can be quite a nice thing to see. As I say, not absolutely necessary, but just a nice touch to have. Um, what else was there? Yeah, another thing under graphic support, you might want to consider setting any of these if you've got uh, a different graphics card. Um, so I'm using a built-in Intel graphics um, GPU um, if for example you've got one of the newer machines and uh, one of the newer CPUs that hasn't got built-in graphics uh, one of the newer Intel's I, I don't know if AMD have that situation or not um, but obviously you wouldn't be able to set this setting um, I'd have to use uh, some other setting but as I say I've got the built-in Intel graphics so uh, just leave that option there by default otherwise you will will have to select something else um, I'm not sure what would happen if you didn't have the correct thing, the correct option set, whether you just get a default VGA screen or if you would get nothing appearing on the screen or not, but it might be worth just checking that that is set correctly, these options here. So that's all there is to do under the graphics. Let's now go to file systems and go to DOS fat x fat nt file systems which is near the bottom here and check the 
VFAT, Windows 95 for support is checked, which it is. Then go to sudo file systems and check the EFI variable system is enabled. So it's set as a module at the moment. I'm going to force that on so it's always available. And then we need to go to native language support and select NLS ISO 88591 which is down here so that's already set there's a couple of others here which are also set by default but looks of it which I always generally tend to ensure they're set just because they're like fallbacks if you like so there's a basic ASCII character set there which is like the mother of all character sets I guess English character sets and also this 437 I set as well if it's not already set which is the US character code co-page and also the 850 which is a European character set as well I tend to ensure they're available um, obviously you might want a different co-page if you're obviously in a different region so you might want to change that there as well so that should be it for the looks of it um, so that's the configuration for the kernel as far as um, grubs concerned and BLFS. So some explanations about why some of the settings have been set there for Linux from scratch. So all we need to do now is to do back on this screen here is to exit. Yes, we do want to save the kernel configuration, and now we need to run make to compile this. I can never remember if make honors the make flags here. I believe it does. If you're unsure, just put the minus J and the number of cores you've got. I'm going to run this and see if it does actually run on all the cores. And yes, it's using three there already. I can see, yes, it is It is honoring that, that flag, that uh, environment variable, which I'd expect it to because it's make that we're running. So I'll just wait for this kernel to finish compiling, which shouldn't take more than a few minutes, really.
Okay, so that has finished compiling. So it took just over three minutes on this machine. Um, so what we need to do next is to install the modules, um, unless you've disabled it in the kernel. So yeah, there's a few there that have been set by default. Um, so now we need to copy some files to the boot directory. And it says if you decide to use a separate boot partition, which I have, maybe sharing the boot partition with the host distro, the files copied below should go there. The easiest way to do that is to create an entry in the boot for booting the ETC FS tab, which we've done. Uh, and then issue the following command as the root user in the true environment. Now, it expresses the true environment there specifically. It's in different colors. It's in bold and it's in black. Um, I've personally never had any problems knowingly of doing it like that. I seem to remember that the boot is already mounted, I think. Yes, I've already mounted it in the host file system. Uh, sorry, in the host system. So uh, because it's been emphasized there, what I'm going to do is to unmount the boot partition from the host system. And I'm going to remount it as they suggest from within the trout. Um, I'm especially taking more care here because I'm building a system D version of Linux from scratch. And as I say, I'm unsure about how it works or what I can get away with and so on and what problems I might cause. So now I have got the boot mounted within the true environment. Um, the path of the kernel image may depend on the plat may vary depending on the platform being used. The file name below can be changed to suit your taste, but the stem of the file name should be VM Linux to be compatible with the automatic setup of the boot process described in the next section. The following command assumes an x86 architecture. So in theory, on a 64-bit Intel machine, Intel Stroke AMD machine, that command should be sufficient and it has worked. So now we need to copy the system map, which has a symbol file, uh, symbols for the kernel. And then we copy the configuration, which is always a good idea as a reference. Um, one thing I didn't show you was to build in the configuration, um, which I'll, I'll show you, but I won't actually rebuild the kernel with it set. Um, menu. It's always quite useful, I find, to have the config built into the kernel because then you can copy the kernel around or go back to a machine, boot it, and just have the configuration for that machine there and then without having to keep any other files around. Um, if I can remember where it is. Oh yeah, there it is. I, th I thought it was higher up. If you uh, select that option, it will... Um, I can't remember exactly what that option does now. Okay, yes, that's right. So that option actually saves the, the config in the kernel. Um, and then this option is an additional option which actually exposes that config.gz which gets stored in the kernel. So I presume there's another way that you could access that config.gz file. Maybe you uncompress the kernel uh, image in some way and you can gain access to the config.gz. But by far the uh, most convenient way is to enable that option and then um, you'll get a virtual uh, well, it's not a virtual file system. You'll get a virtual file that is made available uh, via the kernel um, where you can just treat that as if it was a real file and um, use it uh, to create a new config. So that's the two options that uh, you'll want to set if you want to store and make accessible the config of the current kernel. And you only need to set that once. It just gets updated each time you rebuild the kernel. So I won't save that for now because I'm not going to rebuild the kernel.
Um, so did I copy the config? Yes, I've copied the config. So I just need to run this command here to copy some kernel documentation, which can be extremely useful to have if you're trying to get some hardware working. Um, it's important to note that the files in the kernel source directory are not owned by root. Whenever a package is unpacked as user root, like we did inside Truit, the files have the user and group IDs of whatever they were on the package's computer. This is usually not a problem for any other, any other package to be installed because the source tree is removed after the installation. However, the Linux source tree is often retained for a long time. Because of this, there is a chance whatever user ID the package will use will assign to somebody on that machine. The person would then have to have right. The person would then have right access to the kernel source. So I always recommend leaving the source, the kernel source, uh, lying around. Although it occupies something like two gigabytes, I think. Um, yes, two point two gigabytes. This one. Um, it's worth having around because it means you just go back there, make some changes, rebuild the kernel. It'll rebuild only what it thinks is necessary. It won't rebuild all of the kernel necessarily all of the time. And you can just rebuild it quickly, redeploy it, reboot, and you've got your updated kernel with whatever features you added or removed. Um, rather than starting from scratch, have to re-import the configuration file, run the old config and so on. It's just a lot easier to have the sources lying around. Um, so in many cases, configuration of the kernel will be needed to be updated for packages, as it says, especially if you are doing BLFS, some features need to be installed. So again, it is handy to have it uh, retained. So because of that, we'll run this chone recursively, set all the ownerships to zero, zero, which is equivalent to um, uh, root, root group and root owner. So we do that on the Linux 674 directory. So we're in that directory, just tell it to do it on the uh, parent directory like that. So if we look at these files now, you can see they're all owned by root, as will all the directories and subdirectories and subfiles and so on. Uh, this thing here about using or not using user source Linux and something there about the headers. Um, configuring the Linux module load order. It says most of the time Linux modules are loaded automatically, but sometimes it needs some specific direction. The program that loads modules, mod probe or insmod, uses etc mod probe D USB conf for this purpose. This file needs to be created so that if the USB drivers um, have been built as modules, they'll be loaded in the correct order. So it says that EHCI needs to be loaded prior to OHCI and UHCI in order to avoid a warning being output at boot time. So create this new file by running the following. So we'll install a new directory and then create this configuration file to ensure that they're loaded in correct order. So now we move on to using Grub to set up the boot process. If your system has UEFI support and you wish to boot LFS with UEFI, you should skip the instructions in this page, but still learn the syntax of grub config and the method to specify partition in the file from this page and configure grub and UF with UEFI support using the instructions provided on the BLFS page. So again, this is, again, what I said before, the reason why I stick to the basic boot method because it's just a lot simpler to follow the ins instructions. It, it's simpler full stop. And it's just simpler to follow with the instructions in the Linux from scratch book um, rather than chopping and changing backwards and forwards to uh, what is effectively a different book. Um, so what I shall do is go to this page. We've done the kernel configuration. So it says about creating emergency boot disk, which you can do. Um, I don't do this um, anymore. I used to create back in the bad old days, well, the good old days, um, I, when Grub used to be able to, it used to be small enough to fit on a floppy disk. Um, I did use to create a bootable floppy disk so that you could boot Grub and then try and boot a non working system. Um, but these days, with bootable live distributions, um, I don't really see the point. I guess because we're building Linux from scratch and everything is from scratch, you might want to do that so that you've built your own bootable rescue media from scratch, arguably. Um, but as I say, I've never done this, um, 
Uh, I don't really see the point, but you might want to do it. Um, so let's see, create emergency boot disk, find a spare USB drive, create a free fact. Again, if you want to do it, you've got to go to BLF and, uh, BLFS and install this DOSFS tools uh, to be able to format it. Um, alternatively, because we're still in a live environment, you could just format it from the host system. Um, if you didn't want to install that, or to go to the effort of installing DOSFS tools. So this describes about creating the partition and creating the rescue system on the USB flash drive. So we'll skip that. And so we'll just jump down here to find or create the EFI system partition. <clears throat> um, so on EFI based systems, the bootloaders are installed in a special FAT32 partition called the EFI system partition. So that's why, if you remember, if I do um, back in the host system, fdisk minus L slash dev slash NVMe 0N1, you'll see that I set the EFI system to EFI system type. Um, So if the system supports EFI and a recent version of some Linux distribution or Windows is pre-installed, it's like the ESP is already created. Well, we wiped everything that was on there, the Windows EFI, um, so it wasn't there. As the root user, list all the partitions on your hard drive, so we've just done that. The type column of the ESP should be EFI system, so yeah, we'll just check that in fact. If the system or the hard drive is new or its first installation of a UEFI booted OS on the system, the ESP may not exist. In that case, install DOSFS tools first, then create a new partition, make a VFAT file system on it, and set the partition type to EFI system. Well, as you saw, um, when we're setting up the partition, I've done all that. I created the partition, I set it to the EFI system, and I also formatted it um, using mkfs.vfat. So it should be all set up, ready to go. Now it does say some old UEFI implementations may require ESP to be the first partition on the disk. So I'm hoping that's not going to be a problem. This is a relatively new system. It's a few years old. Uh, well, the technology is a few years old. Um, so the fact that it's a second partition, I'm hoping won't be a problem. Otherwise, I'm going to have to do some uh, reformatting to change that around. Um, so as the root user create the mount point for the ESP and mount it, replacing SDA1 with the device node corresponding to the ESP. So we've got to mount it on boot EFI, but, but uh, EFI hasn't been created yet. So let's now do that from within the Troot partition. So let's just check that we've got the boot partition we have because we've just installed the kernel it's worth checking any case in any way in case we've done something since then where it's not been mounted but you can see the boot partition is mounted on boot i need to now create boot efi so that we've got somewhere to mount the efi partition so if we look in boot now we can see there's the system map file, the config, and the actual kernel file that we um, copied earlier on. There's the EFI directory that I've created. So we can now copy and paste this in here. We just need to change the um, partition name to the correct number, name and number. So as you can see up here, um, where is it? Oh, sorry, it was on the host. The EFI system is on NVMe 0N1P2, so partition 2. So I'll just copy that and paste it there. And the rest of it should remain the same. 
Uh, oh, it looks like this has got an option here to make the directory. Okay, let's do alt hash to remark that out. Let's remove that and let's test that. I didn't wasn't aware that that was a uh, something that's possible. So I'll remove that directory I just created. Recall that command that I had. Um, I'll have to add in the last bit because that's not been retained on that command. Just put that in there. And yes, it's done that automatically for us. So that's that's quite a useful thing to know. So if we now look at the boot directory again, you can see the EFI's been created and the partition has been mounted. And because the partition has been mounted, it obviously hasn't got any timestamp on it for some reason. It's just defaulted to the original epoch of the Linux uh, timestamps, which is January 1st, 1970. And um, if I look inside that, well, it'll probably be empty. But if I do mount, we can see that it has, it has actually been mounted at boot EFI. And we can do DF minus H to see that the amount of space available is 197 meg. So virtually everything that's available. Um, this mount option also so shows us that it's been mounted with the VFAT file system. It mounted successfully, so it proves that we had mounted it using the VFAT file system as well. Um, so if you want to mount the ESP automatically during boot as a root user, add an entry for the ESP into ETC FAT, uh, ETC FS tab. So if you recall, I didn't actually uh, complete that because I wasn't sure what settings would needed to be added in there. I just added the partition number for reference. Um, I don't want this to be mounted by default because, um, again, it's a system partition. It's it relies, or it's it's what uh, the booting of the Linux relies on. So at least if I can get the boot partition or some sort of recovery partition booted uh, or recovery program booted, then um, in the event that the root partition does get trashed for some reason by not having it mounted at all times it just means that there's a slim chance that that wouldn't get trashed if it if it wasn't mounted if it was mounted there is a chance that it could get trashed at the same time as the root partition so what i'll do is i'll copy they're using sda1 i'm not my my boot uh, my if i partition is partition 2 and it's on NVM, nvme so it's obviously different, but I'll copy this. I'll paste that in. I'll try and format this so it's a bit more obvious. When you do this, if you've done a separate EFI partition to the boot partition, make sure it comes after boot, um, just so that the EFI gets booted after boot, uh, sorry, mounted after boot if you do need to mount it. Although having said that, as it's going to be done manually, it probably won't make any difference. Because uh, you'll have to make sure that you've manually mounted boot anyway. Um, so VFAT is the type. So I'm going to do no auto here as well. So it doesn't get mounted automatically. And keep these other options. Code page and IO char set. Uh, looks like they've set it not to be dumped. And it's going to be file system checked at the same time as the root as well. So... I'll leave that as it is. I wonder if that means that I can set that to one as well, actually. So they all get checked at the same time. So that should be sufficient. Minimal boot configuration with Grub and EFI. So on UFI based partitions, Grubs works by installing an EFI application, which is a special kind of executable into the ESP. The EFI firmware will search bootloaders in the EFI applications from boot entries recorded in the EFI variables. And additionally, a hard coded path EFI boot boot x6, x64.efi. Normally, a bootloader should be installed into a custom path and the path should be recorded in the EFI variables. The use of hard coded path should be avoided if possible. However, in some cases, we have to use the hard coded path for these reasons here. So the system is not booted with EFI yet, making the EFI variables inaccessible. Or the EFI firmware is 64-bit, the LF system is 32-bit. Uh, 
which again is not um, the norm, but there are some systems that might work like that. If the LFS is built for a live USB, so we cannot rely on EFI, on EFI variables, again, that's not the case in this situation, or you're un unwilling or unable to install EFI boot manager for mani manipulating boot entries and EFI variables. Well, we had um, installed EFI boot manager, if you remember, we uh, compiled it in the previous video, so we can run that. Um, okay, it's not supported at the moment because we're in a true in a true environment. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so it's this option here at the moment to install Grub with EFI application. Oh, sorry, it's in, so in these cases, these follow these instructions: install Grub EFI application into the hard coded path and make the minimal boot configuration. Otherwise, it's better to skip ahead and set up the boot configuration normally. So to install Grub with EFI application in the hard-coded path, first ensure the boot partition is mounted at boot and the ESP part is mounted at boot EFI, then as the root user run the command. And it says, note that this will overwrite the default and may break a bootloader that's already there. Back it up if you're not sure. So we haven't got anything because it's an empty partition. We can run this command and it says no error reported. And if we look at this path here, we should see that boot x64 has been recorded there. And yes, there it is. And will be booted by boot x64 EFI during the system boot. The EFI firmware usually prefers the EFI application with the path stored in the EFI variables to the EFI application as the hard coded path. So you may to need to invoke the boot selection menu or firmware setting interface to select the newly installed grub manually on the next boot. So that's worth bearing in mind that we might have to manually uh, use the boot option to actually boot the LFS system. So in my case, it was F8 to select it. Um, as I said uh, initially on the first video, you might need to use F12 or F2, F9 on some systems to gain access to that boot menu in the BIOS. Mounting the EFI variable file system, it requires the file system to be mounted. So let's mount this. If the system is booted with the UEFI and system D, EFI files will be mounted all automatically. However, the LFS true environment still needs it to be mounted manually. So let's do that. Okay, it says that the sys firmware EFI EFI vars is not a mount point. Um, right, if the system is not but right, okay, so presumably we weren't booted with the EFI. I thought we were. It'll be missing in this case. You should boot the system UFI mode with the emergency boot disk or using a minimal boot configuration, create the buff, and then mount EFI vars and continue. Okay, so it's something we can't do until we've rebooted then. Um, and let's say even then we're not going to have this graphical environment. We'll have to type these options in by these commands in by hand. So again, that's something else to do when the system is rebooted. So I'll just make a note of that. So I'll just keep a record of that so we know what to do. Okay, so now we can set up the configuration on UEFI based system Grubs works by installing an EFI application. So we've read that already. Right where boot EFI is mounted point of ESP and ID is replaced with an identifier spe specified in the grub install command line. Grub will create an, int create an entry in the EFI variables containing the path EFI ID grub64 EFI so the EFI firmware can find grub64 EFI and load it. So grub64 EFI is very lightweight, 136 KB with grub206, so not much space. So we use not much 
sorry, it will not use much space in the ESP. A typical ESP size is 100 megabytes for Windows Boot Manager, which uses about 50 megabytes. Once it's been loaded by firmware, it will load Grub modules from the boot partition. The default location is Boot Grub. So as the root user, install Grub files into Boot EFI, EFI LFS, Grub64, EFI and Boot Grub. Then set up the boot entry in the EFI variables. So let's run this. So that's worked. And the output is the same as what's in the book, so that's good. Issue, so again, this doesn't work because the variables aren't loaded. Oh, it has worked, okay. Okay, is that because the of what we just run maybe? But you can see that we've still got the EFI uh, boot manager uh, option for Windows Boot Manager. Um, so we want to delete that because Windows doesn't exist anymore. Um, and the boot one, which is the USB uh, boot option, is still exists as well, as well as four and five. So I'm not sure if they'll be deleted or removed when we reboot. But certainly the Windows Boot Manager, the fact that it still exists is slightly worrying. Um, maybe I'll delete that when we've booted into Linux from scratch because as at the moment you can see the current boot is one, which is the USB partition we've boot from. That's the live USB. But you can see the next time we boot, the boot order is um, boot number two, which is the LFS partition. So it should, in theory, boot stra automatically straight into the LFS system. Um, and if it couldn't, then it would try the Windows Boot Manager, which doesn't exist. And then it looks like it will try the live USB, which won't exist either, because I'll make sure that's unplugged, that it doesn't boot from that. So it's either going to boot LFS or not at all, effectively. If it doesn't boot at all, then we'll have to just boot the live system to try and fix what's broken. Next thing, we'll have to create the um, configuration file for Grub. So let's copy this. And we'll paste this in. And we'll have to edit that to make some changes. Because I can see straight away the defaults won't be good enough. So let's edit that. And it says refer to the LFS book for basic knowledge about the Grub file, HD02, SDA, etc. To Mac, uh, yeah, these options must match your configuration. Uh, the InSmod All Video Directive loads various modules for video support. It's needed to initialize the EFI frame buffer for the kernel to print messages correctly for the kernel. GPU driver initialization. So, yeah, in the past I've found that it's not really needed for that, but obviously, if there are some problems, you're not going to see them, they're not going to be printed to the screen. Um, the terminal output GFX term directive changes the display resolution of the Grub menu to match your display device. It will break the rendering if the Unicode PF2 font data is not loaded, so it's guarded by an if directed directive. Um, from Grub's perspective, the files are relative to the partitions used. So because we're in a separate boot partition, we'll have to remember that that's um, basically we, we don't need to have this bit here because we're in the boot partition. That is the effective route that Grub will be running from. Um, and this is what this is telling us about, that the if you use a separate boot partition, remove the boot from the above paths. So that's to the kernel. So it's that one we'll have to remove and to the Unicode PF2. So it's that one there. You'll also need to change the set root line to point to the boot partition, which is that part there. The firmware setup entry can be used to enter the configuration interface provided by the firmware, sometimes called the BIOS configuration. Um, if you've done things slightly differently, you've kept the Windows configuration. Uh, which I have done previously, that you'll want to add an entry for accessing Windows. Um, and there's some information about that as well. 
So let's go back to the LFS book to read about the naming conventions. And it says here Grubbs uses its own naming structures for drives and partitions in the form of HDN stroke M, where N is the hard drive number and M is the partition number. The hard drive numbers start from zero, so we have only one hard drive in this system. So I don't need to change that zero to anything else. And this is this is always bits I forget here, so it's good that it's going into some detail here. But the partition number starts at one for normal partitions and five for extended partitions. Note that this is different from earlier versions where both numbers started from zero. For example, SDA1 is HD0,1 to Grub and SDB3 is HD1,3. Yeah, so STB3, that's the second disk, so the number of the disk goes up by one, and the third partition remains as the third partition. And in contrast to Linux, Grub does not consider CD-ROM drives to be hard drives. So, for example, if using CD on HDB and a second hard drive on HDC, that drive would still be called HD1. So, if you remember, the root partition is the fourth partition on the setup that I've used here. So I need to change this to a four because it's the fourth partition. And then I need to remove the boot from the load font command and also the Linux command. And one thing I will check is the name of the VM Linux because in the past that's changed in the book. I'm not sure if it's because I've used the development book or an early release candidate and the file name hasn't matched up with what's been in the um, kernel grub file so that's the name that the kernel uh, the grub configuration is going to use to load the kernel I'll just look at the boot VM Linux, and you can see it is different because we're using systemd um, this should have systemd on the end so I need to add that to the end of the kernel file name that's going to be loaded. So that should now tie up. I also need to change the root device name here to, let's uh, change that and do fdisk minus L um, slash dev slash nv M E N one uh, N B zero N one. So that's the actual device that I'm the root is on, so I need to change that as well. So that is my root partition. So this is the root partition that Grub uses, and this is the root partition that the Linux kernel uses, so that's why that's specified twice. So I think that is all that's needed to configure Grub correctly, to boot correctly. Um, there's some information there about setting up the configuration. Um, we don't run this because this is for a master boot record installation. We've already run grub install for UEFI as it points to here. Uh, this is the grub configuration file for the bog standard BIOS boot. We've already created our one for the UEFI boot. So don't run that, otherwise you'll overwrite what we've already done. There's some more information there. There's some information here about using UUID, which like I said before, I tend to start using now. Um, as they can be more reliable if you're chopping and changing partitions, uh, which I tend to do uh, in developing and doing these recordings and so on. Um, but I've just used straightforward uh, dev device names this time, so I won't do that this time. Uh, I'm just particularly concerned that I've used systemd this time, and I don't know much about systemd. I don't want to go making mistakes. Or doing things that would work normally but don't work for system D. And there's a warning here about 
a command line called grub mkconfig which can write a configuration file automatically and it uses a set of scripts which will destroy any customizations we've made so um, if you do use that it says to be sure to back up your grub.config file but don't use it if you rebuild the kernel just re um, just recopy the files that created as we did initially um, to the boot partition 